The real nub of it, morally, ethically, even even kind of cosmologically, is how we deal with each other. Like, okay, I'm in a simulation. Okay, I'm in a false phenomenal world. How do I deal with this person I'm in love with? How do I deal with this person who is my enemy? How do I deal with a dying parent? But if I have the hunch that this is a simulation and there are other people like me there who aren't just simulations, it puts weird pressure on my, on my ethics. How do I deal with somebody else who's in a false world but who's actually behind that avatar is someone like me that I really want to communicate with, fall in love with, uh, bond together with. And, and that's really key to Phil Dick. Like, yeah, Phil Dick was kind of crazy. He had, you know, visions. He could never decide what they meant. He was neurotic and pathological and paranoid and all those things. But at the same time, constantly throughout all of the texts, there's this very grounded empathy with people suffering under these false conditions. He, these very real portrayal, very sobering portrayals of human beings that are still, they have a heart. And that heart is what kind of keeps you going as you suffer <laughs> these various nightmare scenarios that he, he throws your way, including the ultimate one of just not knowing. Uh, and I think that that's one of the ways that people get attracted to simulation hypothesis is because it seems to maybe solve problems, but I think it just makes the problems even more, plain, you know, kind of poignant and in your face. Excellent words from Eric Davis, appearing in Rodney Asher's excellent documentary, A Glitch in the Matrix. A crucial message on how to navigate the Black Iron Prison, especially in these days of divide and conquer viruses and circling firing squad programming. It's what is in our heart that sustains us. And as Gilles Gispel said, Gnosis is the knowledge of the heart. We'll delve deeper into these themes in this episode as we discuss Philip K. Dick and transhumanism and all its evil manifestations. AI, scientism, eugenics, singularity, and the coming metaverse. No one here gets out alive. But together, we can rise as pure, unlimited, and untethered consciousness. You know it, and I, Miguel Connor, am here with you all the effing way. That's what the Matrix does. It weaponizes every idea, every dream, everything that's important to us. To execute this mission, and overcome the transhumanism golem, we must choose ecstasy over entertainment. We must champion the experience of high weirdness. We must know that our lives stretch much farther than our meat sack. People want their egos to understand everything, to know all the answers in the universe, name each argon behind the curtain. However, that's folly to an extent. So is getting overtangled in the speculative thistles of why am I here or what is the purpose of life? You know what your life's purpose is? Fulfilling a mission. I know my ego isn't quite sure what the mission is, but when it's aligned to my soul's purpose, there is an intense sense of freedom, euphoria, and peace that informs my ape brain that I'm in the right direction. That will happen to you, too. What's the meaning of the universe? What's the meaning of a flea? The, uh, it's just there. That's it. And your own meaning is that you're there. We forget that the inner value, the, the rapture that is associated with being alive is what it's all about. Sure, you'll know so much more as you uncover more truths in the labyrinth lie that is this terra damnata. 
and more revelations are downloaded from the Pleroma. You'll be disturbed and then amazed, as the Gospel of Thomas says, while Gnosis floods your psyche. You'll do more and navigate better. But at the end of the torturous day, it's all about flowing with the energies of the great life, as the Mandeans say, and being there for the least of our brothers. Beautiful silver egg guarantees immortality. That's in the Bible, Phil. Jesus speaks about it several times. I still say the work has to be done here on earth. Let me ask you this. Where did Jesus do his work? Where did he teach? Marshall McLuhan famously said, I don't know who discovered water, but I can tell you it wasn't a fish. Guess what? Your ego will never discover that ocean of eternity. That is for your higher self to manage. This is bullshit. I'm not listening to this. You are insane. No, you're insane. We simply do not have time for this crap. When someone wondered to St. Augustine about what time is, he responded, If I am not asked the question, I know the answer. Get the vibe? In a movement and a meditation, as the Gospel of Thomas says as well, in that place of silence and stillness the secret book of John talks about, is where we will understand all of reality. Because we're beyond questions, beyond time, in the flow of our infinite power. As Union Joel Croker said, The ego wants an answer. The self doesn't care about answers. It just keeps living into the larger question. Always, always, always. I remember I am energy, not memory, not self. My name, my personality, my choices all came after me. I was before them and I will be after. It was Joseph Campbell who famously wondered, is the mind the vehicle of consciousness or is consciousness the vehicle of the mind? You chose the former and that's brought you to the virtual Alexandria. Welcome to the place we defeat transhumanism and embrace that Dionysian mysticism. We continue to run with those searching for the truth and avoid those who have found it. Welcome to the greatest adventure of your many lives. Well, it's not really a measure of mental health to be well adjusted in a society that's very sick. For our topics in this eternal now, there is no one better in Mithra's abode than James Tony writer, artist, academic, and all-around nemesis of the empire that never ended. We'll cover many of his amazing books, but focus more on his latest work, Human Entrance to Transhumanism. You won't be the same after this interview, oh you shining crazy diamonds. A oh, fuck off. Hey, fuck off. Let me quote Eric from A Glitch in the Matrix on our reality today. The primal theme with PKD is the tension between our social construct and how to fragment from it. And it goes into solipsism or psychosis and definitely paranoia. Philip K. Dick captured the texture of our lives like getting a lot of alerts. The contemporary world was just recreating the animus world that pre-modern people saw. Dick's work captures that sense of profane, technological animism, that aliveness that is not very trustworthy. Dick was always aware of the broken. People are broken. Technologies are broken. Cosmologies are broken. Gods are broken. Look, as sentient meat, however illusory our identities are, we craft those identities by making value judgments. Everybody judges all the time. Now, you got a problem with that, you're living wrong. What's scented meat? It's all broken, don't you see? But we of the broken places accept this fully 
and navigate it so well. We no longer run from Sophia. As James True said recently, knowing they lie to you is intelligence. Knowing you lie to yourself is wisdom. We're done lying to ourselves. We're done selling out. We're just going to embrace our ecstasy and empathy. I mean, things might get worse for a while. Maybe people will die. We all die eventually. The real tragedy is forgetting to live. Save yourself. We still can. As a Gen Xer, I've witnessed the powers and principalities corrupt my myths to cut my generation's psyche from the energies of numinous archetypes. They ruined Star Wars and they ruined Star Trek. Thanks, dickface JJ. They ruined The Matrix and they ruined comic books. They ruined He-Man, Alien, Cowboy Bebop, and even Looney Tunes. And fuck you, Bono. You were always ruined. They ruined our modern folklore to disconnect us from what they represented. Older myths that ignited dangerous apotheosis. Myths are clues. Myths are clues to the spiritual potentialities of the human life. What we're capable of knowing within. Yes. You change the definition of a myth from the search for meaning to the experience of of meaning. Experience. Experience of life. The experience of life. To an extent, they did it in a way the church did to paganism. Like turning eros from the binding principle of the universe into a mere aspect of lust or a butt-naked baby with a bow and arrow. Like turning Dionysus from the Lord of the Boundless into a fat, drunken slob riding a gay ass. Like turning Aphrodite into a MILF while making the world forget she is also the chief manifestation of war and destruction. Making proud gods into boring, incel saints. And so on, and so on. The burning of witches, the Spanish Inquisition, the uh, slaughter of pagan tribes and so on. Anyway, there we are. He does one chapter, I believe, on like religious icons, where the icon starts to represent God and it loses its power of a true connection to God because then you're with the icon and then you have a simulation of an icon until it becomes on the dashboard of your car. You know, a decay of meaning. As they destroy the lower and middle class, as they consume the resources and want us to own nothing and like it, as they hypnotize us with digital utopias that are actually dystopias for human individuality, they disconnect us from our myths, our dreams, the individuating energies of the imaginal. We, Gen X, were the one generation that saw through the hologram, that understood what this world really was like. We were the awakened ones, truly. But we made the mistake of not disengaging enough, not drawing enough lines in the sand. To fight the empire is to become infected with its derangement. And we thought our penetrating, mocking humor, music, and social activism would make enough of a difference. It didn't. Don't make that mistake younger generations hit the transhumanists hard but disengage at the same time don't play their game don't let them serve you toxic versions of the great myths and stories demand originality everywhere especially beyond your ego that like mine is a fish trying to understand water then your authentic self will rise and strike most of all, don't let Wetiko separate you from others out there who are hurting, who are lost, who are seeking a deeper connection. That's my advice. No one here gets out alive. You can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. Led us to a memorable interview with James Tony. 
We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Welcome everybody to the Aeon Byte interview. And with us, we have the pleasure and honor of being joined by James Tooney. How are you, James? Grand, more like funny or, or, or honey, Mr. Mr. Connor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great to see you, Miguel. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Uh, enjoy your, your show. And uh, we listen to you over this side of the world as well. Good. So um, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, and apologies for that. I had to laugh because for years I worked in Irish pubs and everybody, all the Irish and Scottish called me Miguel. And at some point I just gave up or I would yeah. tell them, <laughs> just call me Manuel from, you yeah. know, Faulty oh, Don't Towers. say that now. I'll be saying that. Too. You'll confuse me. Uh, that was my <laughs> nickname for years, Manuel. I had, I was, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, it's great, James. Uh, I love your work. I love what you're doing. Again, our audience will certainly agree with it. But uh, I wanted to ask about how this, you might say, happened to you. Did you, you've been in law, you've been in academia, you've been in the belly of many beasts, if you would. Did you have sort of a, a red pill moment or perhaps it was more like uh, Buffalo Springfields uh, for what it's worth? And one day you said there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. And you went down a rabbit hole. I guess we could bring up Jefferson Airplane and go ask Alice. <laughs> well, th there's a funny, I suppose, context to it in that uh, my father was born in 1918. So at that stage. We didn't even have a Republic of Ireland. So, I mean, people forget how short things are in historical terms. And even though he was he was from a Republican background and his family were fighting and all the things, and he, he, that was his, his sympathies as well, he still would have ended up, for example, in Egypt in 1945 at the time of the, in, in the RAF. Uh, so these, we have complex loyalties in these things. Um, and uh, he, his family, his father was a member of parliament. His, 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 his brother was a member of parliament. So we were very involved and Ireland is a small place. So you can see things happening. So you get, you get a good perspective on what the real world is. And they had come from a context where a lot of them had been in prison and all this kind of stuff. So if we go back to my father's uncles and that, they, they were, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking to these old men that would have been out fighting in the hills and, and flying columns and that, in jail, digging tunnels out of jail. So the, the paradigm actually was that the state was not a good guy. So this, this is a different starting point. So it's only for a short period of time, maybe one generation or two, that the state in Ireland becomes a good guy. And that didn't, didn't last for that long. <laughs> and I could even see that transition. So um, I, I went to study law and I did three degrees in law and went on. And I, so I led a, principally an academic an academic. Uh, legal life and in that context i focused on issues that were of the future at the time issues that at the time people weren't interested in but were, were becoming uh, big issues of the future i was always interested in the future so i studied issues like antitrust law and which is very very important uh, intellectual property and communication technology law european law and then went on and set up programs in them even things like china and world trade law so when I was, I was teaching, I was often teaching in business schools so or management schools, the, the, the teaching the law in the law context in, in, in those. So I had access to a lot of other disciplines. I also taught in St. Andrews uh, part-time in, in, in international relations school. I made a big effort to try and see what was going on in the different contexts, to try and build on a pattern, to try, see what was happening. 
Um, and certainly, if you look at what happened in the political context in Britain uh, with the Iraq war, well, I mean, it's a crystal clear case. I mean, it's cut and dry. And, and when you saw what happened in the media, I was in New York when Colin Powell w w w was giving his talk and, and I was down the road. I, I, I was and I, I seen the cavalcade go. And you, you remember what lies were told to the public and what lives were lost as a result of lies and American lives as, as well. And this thing, as we know, has been going on for, for ages. Um, so uh, that that was was that made a lie of all the claims that were going to be made, and also some of these issues. I saw them coming from nowhere. I remember reading cases about things that are now common, but they weren't common back then, a generation ago. These things weren't on the radar screen, and then you see them. I seen them bubbling up at conferences. The idea of hate crime, for example. Never, you know, I heard the criminologists discussing this, and I was it, it never made sense. It created cognitive dissonance straight away. What was wrong with the legal or the ability of the legal system that was there for thousand years to adapt? So there was a whole load of things. And then in the universities, what happened very, very quickly, people forget about the universities that a lot of the networks developed were developed in the universities. So a lot of the information sharing systems were kind of prototyped true systems like Janet in, in Britain and that. And I, for example, tried to set up a, a an online legal journal which with interviews, which it didn't exist at the time. It was well well before a podcast ever happened. And and people said, well who would want to live who would want to do something like that? <laughs> Listen to audios of, you know, so sometimes you can be ahead of your time uh, in that sense. Um, but what happened over a period of time was that the universities began to become more centrally managed. You see things being coordinated. You go from one university to another, and the same particular thing was happening. It was like a Philip K. Dick novel. Same details were, were occurring in different places. So you could see a degree of coordination. And then, uh, then in the end, I also thought I, I, I saw thought it was a crash coming, uh, and uh, I was quite clear on that. I didn't have uh, I don't. I'm not heavily invested in things, but I thought it was a good time to sell sell my <laughs> sell my uh, little apartment. Uh, and also, uh, I, we had children, and I said, "Okay, well, we're going to have a. Ch well, I'm not going to stay in this environment anymore, especially with children." So I decided to be the, the stay-at-home father and to paint, concentrate on things that I wanted to do. To use the other side of the brain. So I began. To, so the objective was paint right and look after the children and in that context over a period of time i began to have that those things more specifically not that i didn't have them before but more specifically about downloads if you like and they 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 began to explain to me what the the rational part couldn't work <laughs> out from all the detail so you could say it was one part of the brain talking to the other i don't actually believe i believe that we do have access to the higher domains. And they began to, and from that, I began to write, write the, the mystical accord was the first one. And that was, that clearly started off from, uh, what happened was I began to, I was, I, I was after leaving one of my daughters to, to play school. Now I kept them out of school as long, as long as possible because they're, they're, they're too long in school in my view. It, it, and, and I kept them out and, and so they can have a, a, as much freedom as they can. So I, I used to drop off the, the, them to the to the local play school, if you like, uh, and we'd we'd always be late playing on the trees, doing all the things, the important things, walking there, playing games. It was great. And I was coming home one day, and I began to get I began to get a few lines into my head, and I I noticed that they were in kind of haiku form in seventeen syllables. So I just began to get a whole load of them, and and that made me look again at the mystical literature, made me look again at stuff I had read years ago, but it's in the back. It's kind of vague in some sense, you know, I'm, although I come from a Catholic background and that's very, 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 very that was very clear to me what, what that involved. And in Ireland, there's a very subtle and strong kind of element or remains or the, what used to be up to very recently of that pre-Christian pagan druidic thing, which is in the air if you wanted to look for it. And I did. Um, and um, they began to manifest itself in a different, not, not, not those things, but the spirituality began to manifest. And I began to look again 
at what the literature said with a fresh mind and began to to go back and review again with as open mind as possible. And also I did it a lot of it after I had the impressions. So I said, well, does this does this add anything or, or or what? And I began to find that actually it tied into, but there was originalities in that. And in particular, what emerged from it was a concern about technology. That was, the positive side was about light and the evolution and the path and what it meant. And the negative side was this darkness about technology. And that, that was a that was a, a clash that came intellectually and and and, and spiritually. What a wonderful journey, and thanks for sharing. Um, and again, I I agree with uh, much what you say, and I can relate to your journey. I always been telling people recently, me being born in 1968 in Portugal under Salazarish, I was born under a real fascist dictator, not you know Trump mm. or Boris Johnson or all these you know wannabes, but mm. you know secret police, you'll get shot and all that. So, and when we would travel that's when the portuguese could actually speak freely of what was going on been going on in portugal for decades along with franco so well like with you that sort of uh background sort of fueled me through the years and it helped me like you wake up to the technocracy that we're facing uh the eugenics you know kind of the stuff that came out with fascism so um it's uh, definitely a, it's, it's sobering, but I'm I'm very grateful for being born there now. <laughs> I also and, on that point on the Iberian connection, I, I did also uh, teach English for a couple of years. When I, I, I after after studying law for seven years, I said I had enough of this, and I had in my head an image of going to the south of France and uh, painting women and drinking wine and you know all that Cathar stuff. Should, country you know. and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah, at the time, but a, a, a romantic view, a bit of sunshine yeah. and, and and cheap wine and and <laughs> and, and painting. But uh, someone asked me. I, I ended up in the Basque country, and the thing about that was that uh, again, I, I could talk to some of the old guys that remember people being thrown off the cliffs, that remember some of the the grim stuff, and as you know. The Spanish Civil War was a brutal, a brutal affair, and and also more complex than people think because they say, "Oh, well, these were the good guys here." There's Orwell, the good guy, and you say, "Well, hold on, well, you know, the Stalinists and the Trotskyists. People don't know about these uh, subtleties, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't until until people. I remember, I remember being listening to Christy Moore, the the uh, Irish singer, and he was. With with a man who had fought in the Spanish Civil War, this was in Scotland, and he had a, a hole in his head from where he was shot, and uh, with his other friend, and and they were telling me about. I remember one of them telling me about the, how great it was in China, and I was, <laughs> you know, and you know what I mean. Uh, the, the 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 point is not not to criticize them because I, I I you have to talk to every different perspective, but. If people don't know what they're talking about when they're talking about communism or fascism or whatever ism, whatever system that wants to control people, if they don't know historically what they're talking about, well, then they don't know what's in store for them. And I think we're already far down the road. Now, it doesn't matter what you call it, whatever system, because they're moving between each other, especially when they're coming together. And as we know, Deng Xiaoping in China said it doesn't matter what, but he used the white cat or the black cat. And uh, it's going to catch the mail. We're the mice now. So <laughs> they're joining together. It, 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 that, that's the problem of, 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 of big government. But I think it's very important that that experience uh, that, that you talk about. Oh, yes, indeed. When you know family who've been thrown in jail and what they've been going through or friends who just vanished. And, you you know, you see, you see, I was young, but again, you hear this. So and as I tell people, if you want to wake up, just read a damn history book and then read another one and another one. Then you'll see uh, what did Mark Twain said? History doesn't repeat, but it certainly rhymes. And you realize the tricks of the fascists or the communists or the capitalists, the, you know, in the, you know, the J.P. Morgans. The, it's just happening here. They just kind of the hologram shifts bringing him. Yes. Philip and one more point. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Miguel. No, no but, problem. But when I was growing up in, in, in Dublin, of course, 
uh, well, I remember not many bombs, but I remember hearing the bombs go off in Dublin. And I know people that were involved in the things, you know, uh, young guys that got involved and that would have been uh, seriously wanted people. Uh, and at that stage, when I was a boy, there was people, we had, of course, we had an internment in Northern Ireland, which meant that you're in prison without, without trial. You know, I mean, people forget about this in, in, in the early 70s. People forget about the fact that the United uh, Kingdom government was brought to uh, the European Court of Human Rights and was accused of torture. They, they didn't want politically to go for that, but they, they found that they were guilty of inhumane treatment. Now, this is, this is only when I was a boy. Now, this is, for example, proven cases. Many of them, they take in a helicopter blindfolded and they bring you up and they throw you out. And, you know, it, it wasn't torture because they, they, they lived, they... they, they they were only scaring the people, you know. But I mean, mm -hmm. this is what this is what government, and this is not just an anti-English. This this is about governments, about systems all over the world. People don't know about that. People don't know how how bad they can be. So so the point about the other point, another little interesting thing I remember was at a time in 1981, uh, when um, uh, Bobby Sands died, the hunger striker. A funny thing about about I remember specifically, this was a, a funny thing about being in the atmosphere, uh, waking up about, uh, I think it was 20 past one, and you could feel something in the air. You could literally feel it. You could, uh, you could feel the in the atmosphere. And I, I'm, I'm meaning that in a palpable sense. Now, you could say, well, of course, the man was, it was the 66th day, or day of hunger strike. And you, but, but I mean, it was, it was a very, very specific feeling and i know they, they're trying to measure these things but these things exist i remember at the time as well the the ceasefire was de declared and it was a, a subtle thing you, you could feel a kind of little knot go out your stomach you don't people don't realize how this stuff is embedded in in, in you physically and that's part of the process um so uh, uh, all those things contribute towards the necessity to be vigilant about public uh, processes and about uh, uh, that this thing, these dangers are not hypothetical. We've been living in a kind of fluffy cloud for a while, and that's why people like Philip K. Dick were very, very uh, nearer the nearer the mark in in their fears about what was happening, particularly in America and the Nixon administration. Yeah, yeah, it's still going on. Again, uh, I want to bring up Philip K. Dick. And as I say on my show, the empire never ended. These things are going, yeah. they're more subtle. And something I want to get into, because I was reading your book, and I kept thinking, uh, this line in the exegesis, uh, not in the one in Vallis, but uh, Philip K. Dick's talking about the demented creator God and everything. But then he goes, we we are in the hands of a dangerous magician and it's always interesting because he switches from the demented idiotic uh, yaldabaoth of the gnostics to the dangerous magician and then i think of your work because you keep hammering again this uh technocracy or scientism it is hypnotizing us it is that's like his first role is not to conquer us but to hypnotize us with all this propaganda and social media when we have no idea how to act by then we're completely mesmerized yes and um i found it a little bit funny when, when you know there's a debate or a discussion i'm glad there is now about mass formation but i mean it's crystal clear and i and i had a i knew a guy who was a hypnotist a stage hypnotist and i remember i asked him years ago when i was a student i said is television a good or what about television and hypnosis he said a fantastic medium he began to explain so uh, i was very aware of, of of that day i was always interested in the power uh, of the spell but there, there, there's a there's a thing that people don't understand about the sorcery uh, sorcerer and sorcery and i i became more conscious of this point reading about the anthropology of magic and the point is that sorceries sorcerers are usually employed by the ruling class this is what people ignore or forget uh, and th there's an assumption that the magicians are the marginalized ones but the ones on the outside but that's not the way that's not the way it works so they are an important part and and that's why they will assimilate uh, magical forces 
uh, into the body of, of, of the system. Um, and that's, that's a thing that people don't understand. And they, when you look at, for example, the persecution of witches, the reason why they persecute witches, for example, often in the Protestant context, the Counter-Reformation in the Catholic context uh, was, was when they published or, or, or they persecuted more uh, witches. But, uh, but the, the, the persecution really got going uh, as a counterweight uh, to, to the, the Reformation. People forget about the, the Protestant influence. They always attribute it towards the Catholic, just as a matter of history. Uh, and the reason, of course, why King James and them were, were so concerned with witches is because they believed in these things. They just didn't want them to be directed against them. So uh, it wasn't necessarily coming from church doctrine w w w was, the, was the key. And this interest in magic is there in every kind of royal family. Interest in blood, for example, and, and, and this, the, the, the mystical significance of blood, it's underestimated area of study um, and the, uh, the implications of that. And the belief that magic works, and you can see that, I suppose, a bit even in the story of Rasputin, although I think there's, there's distinctions. Uh, Rasputin wasn't a magician, he was a, he was a mystic in my sense. But, but I mean, in the sense of the openness to an alternative solution, there's always been figures that have been drawn to the um, drawn to power. And that's, uh, you can see that, of course, in the, in the John Dee context, in, the, in Elizabeth I. So uh, the, but this point is not, this, this point is not some fanciful point that comes from anthropology. It's made by, uh, by the father of cybernetics himself, who when he wrote about God and Golem says that the, the great danger with cybernetics is of the gadget worshippers who are engaged in sorcery. So that's Norbert uh, Wiener, Wiener, whatever way you want to pronounce it. He said that, he, he wrote that. Now he's involved in the thick of it. So he can see it. The other person that clearly saw this was uh, C.S. Lewis. And in his book, That Hideous Strength, and it's remarkable because he's writing this in 1945. And we, we talk, you know, you've talked about the significance of 1945. Um, so in That Hideous Strength, remember, as you do, that he's saying that the universities are taken over by the progressive wing. So he's, it's not just an American phenomenon. The universities are taken over. The city is taken over. The scientific mechanism is taken over, and the people that are taken over are engaged in sorcery, and their objective is to to unite and to unite against, uh, to unite across boundaries and to unite against people. Now, I locate this in the 1920s uh, in particular. Uh, the, here, here's a, a funny. Before I finish, <laughs> uh, J. D. Bernal, who wrote the book *The World of Flesh and the Devil*. Uh, the, the great crystallographer uh, who wrote about the science of science and explained what was going to happen to the world. Uh, he said, and, and this is a great scientist who inspired Crick and Watson and, uh, and others and contemporary scientists, he said that, um, you know, there'd be the breakaway civilization for the scientists to explore and the, the, the body would, would, would become a machine and biology would, would be gone and that the others, the people that didn't want to go along, would live in a human zoo for experiments. He said that in 1920. It's only 100 years. That's, that's, clear, that's clear in the book. Now, in Britain, the people that are running this, the people that are running the emergency of that's going on at the moment, that you might have heard about that stuff, <laughs> the, the acronym is, is SAGE, uh, the Scientific Advisory Group of Emergency, something like that. Sage was the nickname for J.D. Bernal. That was his nickname. Oh, wow. Nobody has, has, has seems to have noticed this. It's a kind of a perverse joke, almost psychopathic, that the group that are running circumstances that are taking over government have the name of the man who in 1920 said we will be living in, in a human zoo. I mean, here, here we are sitting, communicating. It's great to talk to you on Zoom. Zoom. A zoo, huh? <laughs> came out of nowhere i mean re really when you begin to look at it and you begin to what there's a kind of a there is a, da a dangerous kind of comic magician but that's not the cosmic comic thing right. it's it's a more pathological uh, uh, uh comic thing and magic is certainly there so in all these stories and, and what actually c.s lewis was saying and bearing in mind 
his Christian background, he was very, very open to rediscovery of the myths that could be used to help us. And the figure that I've gone back to, I'm going back to recently, is the early Irish monks uh, from the, the 500s. And these were remarkable uh, men. And they had power over sorcerers. It's quite clear. And I believe it to be true. So, I mean, people are too, e too quick to dismiss some of these figures. But um, really, they kind of anticipated uh, some of the modern context and informed some of the modern context, in particular Joyce and that. Um, but uh, we're going to have to rediscover the... Because the revolution has happened. We're not expecting the revolution. The revolution has happened. Now we're talking about a counter-revolution. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about... Uh, Kennedy's uh, junior talked about a global coup d'etat. I'd, I'd, I'd used that expression. It's happened. I, I, I trace it to uh, the start of uh, 2020. I, I believe it has happened. And the uh, so when we're talking the, the, when we're talking about these magicians, they're constructing something. And I know you you, you did a very good talk recently about uh, Lucifer's uh, technology. Uh, um, I, I enjoy that. And that's true, but, but we have to focus on what the objective is of the, the mechanism and uh, that it's a, real, it's, a, it's a real phenomenon, it's a real plan. And um, a few more points, but I don't want to go on too long, sorry. No, it's really wonderful of what you're saying. And yeah, uh, uh, as I often repeat on this show, and I think it's true, is the old saying, millionaires don't practice astrology, billionaires practice astrology, which means right, uh, yeah. the elite know this magic works. And yep. again, uh, in the Bible, Saul goes to the witch of Endor because he knows he's going to get results as a king. Yes. And in Roman times, what people forget is that the Romans, part of their success is they they completely constricted magic. They it, they would kill you if you did magic outside the law. They would create bureaucracies and pay. You had to pay money, so they were able to kill that wonderful mysticism. That's why the old saying: "If you want magic, you would go down to the Jew down the road," because only people in the margins, like the Gnostics and the Jews, still had that ancient knowledge, even beyond the Romans. So, these are uh, excellent points, but. Moving to transhumanism, James, I don't know if you've ever read a book by Adrienne Mayer, uh, Gods and Robots. She's an academic at Stanford, and she talks about how even the ancients were interested in robotics. The Chinese, the ancient Greeks would try to create steam and, you know, basic robotics. And then how the Greeks were interested in transhumanism, because, for example, and when they would put on this armor, the armor had a human face. It had the the nipples too, like bat, like one of the Batman movies. So the Greeks were toying with this transhumanism idea. But what you're talking about is not what the ancients had in mind, because the Greeks were still connected to nature. They believed in the dignity of man. They believed in being humble. They believed in magic. This is a different type of transhumanism that the ancients were working on. Yeah, they didn't want to become God. Well, they did want to become God, or they do want to become God. <laughs> oh yeah, they, not, yeah, but that's for the elite. It's not for the mass. The, right. I think the correct term and the, how I've sought to define it is network transhumanism. So what we will get is bargain basement implants that will control you. Uh, that's what it is. So where, while the elite can get all their all the higher level stuff. That comes out because we're not going to be living for 500 years. They, 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 it doesn't make sense. They're going on talking about overpopulation and they're going to extend life with all the resource implications. It just it just doesn't stack up. The as I've said, the the ads on is an ads that that doesn't doesn't uh, add up at all. So what we're talking about is very basic transhumanism. All they have to do is get something inside your body to colonize your body. And, and Philip K. Dick uh, explored this, as we know, uh, very in very many contexts. So all they have to do is set a precedent whereby they can insert something in your body for the good of the public. Now, that's not a high standard anymore. Um, so 
Especially the, not in Sweden, where everybody's happy <laughs> about the chips, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I predicted that in my book, uh, Blue Lies September. But uh, <laughs> anyway, but so the uh, yeah, they're doing that in in, in Stockholm and 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 uh, well, we'll, well, but the 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 principle is is clear. If they get inside the body, they can control us and they can make us make life uncomfortable, make do, they make us dependent. And, and the key thing is dependent. So once that happens, once there is a node inside us, well, then we're subject to the algorithm, subject to control, subject to monitoring. So that, that's all they need. So the first phase has been incredibly successful. Get people to carry a mobile phone. So that, that's, the, that's the first step. Uh, and of course, as that progresses, um, there'll be all kinds of reasons why that can't continue. Mobile phones cause you can't. Oh, we, we, you know, we have big problems. Well, you say, well, I have no money. I can't because we were dependent on this digital money that you, you forced us to use. You, you, create, you made dependence. Um, can't go anywhere. You need this thing. As Philip K. Dick talked about in uh, Flow My Tears, the, the, the same kind of context. So, um, so they say, well, well listen, we don't have to big to, to drill that big one inch hole in your skull anymore to get the thing in. You can you can swallow it. So uh, it's very very easy. Oh, that's great. We don't have to have the bit. That's fantastic. So we know that the, the, that's what John Lilly was working on. I know he's celebrated for all his contributions to consciousness studies, but that's what he was doing. You know, implanting things in monkey brains, and he knew it was coming. And he knew also that we'd be living in dome cities. And he knew that the water would be, he, he, he predicted that. I mean, he was involved in that. So um, he saw where it was going. Um, and that, this, is, this is a continuation of what Bernal said in the 20s. He said that scientific corporations, by stealth, will take over world governance. And this was totally consistent with what, his, with what H.G. Wells said in The Open Conspiracy in 1929 and The New World Order, where he said, that uh, there, was, there would be an open conspiracy whereby scientists would take over the world and we'd have a directorate which would run the world uh, according to the elite principles. So, so, I mean, so what happened was that what I call the empire of scientism, that science transmuted after Huxley uh, into the idea that they could use the British imperial structure uh, to combine with others to create a global structure. And that's out of there comes Arthur C. Clarke. It's a, it's a bit of a problem when we come to interpret people like Aldous Huxley, you know, and some of the, you know, where, where he is in the line, even, even an Orwell, and even other, even figures like, um, uh, th there's other figures there that, you know, you say- well, A lot of Fabians around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're either warning you because they know what's happening. They've read the script. Or they're priming, you know. Um, so whatever way, they're, 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 to, to a certain extent, you have to to look for the truth that comes up. Now, I think C.S. Lewis was in the thick of it, and he was trying to to warn us. He saw the Scientocracy, he predicted the Scientocracy. He saw the attack on the spirit of humankind, and that this is what's involved. This is what we're fighting for at this day. I say fighting in a non-violent <laughs> context because we have to use our imagination on this one. We have to use our magic on this one that we're actually struggling for the uh, counter-revolution to protect Homo sapiens. I believe it is that, that, deep, uh, that, that, that it's the existence of humans as we know, and, and the transhumanists are quite clear on that. But what people have to get into their minds, the promise that they're saying, oh, you will walk on water, they're trying to recreate the biblical thing, you know, we'll make the blind see and all, all this thing. Every, no, no one is against that. Who's against that? You know, that's what medical... That's what medical developments are doing. That's the product, not of transhumanism. That's the product of medical science where it has gotten to and the goodwill of people that are interested in helping other people over hundreds of years that are interested in studying the human body to help other people. It's not down to some philosophy of control. It's the opposite. But uh, it's a mistake for people not to anticipate that we're talking about a fairly low level of mass implantation uh, to, to, to get this network uh, transhumanism, to force you to be associated, to join up with a network, to be assimilated, to be controlled. And once that happens, there's no going backwards. 
it only needs to distort your perception. It only needs to change your how you interpret the world. It only needs to monitor your movements. We've given that up already. We've given up this uh, to, to the this, the electronic straitjacket. Who uh, well, apart from me, book <laughs> and others and yourself. Uh, I mean, who would have believed that people would so easily imprison themselves in, the, in, in, in their own home, uh, abandon rights that have been uh, evolved over hundreds of, 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 of years? And as well as that, the, uh, the, the, another point to, to, to finish off on is that the systems have been laid there, and it's there for, it's there for people to see, constitutional lawyers like Dale Scott talked about, how government will be displaced that that has been laid out in the last in the last uh, generation uh, explained how this pro how, how the government has already planned for this that that's not a conspiracy that's 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 a fact so the systems are there to do it um so that's 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 the concern from a civil rights perspective that we have to and what, why we have to unite on that one Agreed 100%. And as you said, um, we have to see if we have a government, for example, as I, as I mentioned in an email before with you, uh, there's this argument online, do we live in an Orwellian dystopia? Do we live in a Huxleyan dystopia? And people love to debate. It's, there's even a Wikipedia entry on this. And as I said, I think people need to remember we live in or consider we live in a Phil Dickian dystopia, because uh, what Phil predicted and i always think of uh what uh, ray bradbury said i don't try to predict the future i try to avoid it a true prophet of israel and phil dick was exactly the same but as you have mentioned many times his idea that we would have these mega corporations that are extremely powerful i mean now apple has higher gdp than canada these corporations are more powerful than most first world countries and they're the real movers in Silicon Valley, the home of uh, t technocracy. So Dick was pretty much right. Would you agree? Well, um, I saw uh, a talk. Russell Brand did actually the other day about five corporations ruling the world. He, he, was, he was talking. And Philip K. Dick has that in one of his books, Five Corporations Rule the World. It's quite remarkable. I forget which one. But uh, he has that. That when the five corporations ruled the world. Now, the good thing about being in Ireland, as I said, is you could see what happened. Now, I believe that democracy died, and it died in particular uh, from the 70s onwards. There, there was a, a takeover of, of government internationally. The process of globalization was a, a technique to take power from national governments. Uh, and that, that's what it was, that with, with free trade agreements, World Trade Organization. I've been to the World Trade Organization a couple of times. I did projects for the United Nations. Uh, so I have a bit of knowledge about some of this stuff. Uh, but my belief is that the process of globalization was really to take power away from the nation state. And it did that. And it transferred it into the pocket of corporations. Now, people forget about the power of corporations, um, the, the fact that the Indian colonization by the British was done by the East India Company. The government took it over afterwards. So a few hundred people, including John Locke uh, in the city of London, could, uh, could, could control India, 200 million people. Uh, people forget, they say about the Pilgrim Fathers uh, and, and coming over to, 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 to America, and they paint it as a, a construction by uh by uh, protestant but that was part of the commercial plantation system now this is this is another thing that people forget the plantation system and particularly as it was applied to slavery um goes back to the irish context goes back to the roman the the, the roman systems it goes back to the to the taking of african slaves to places like iraq and, and, and the middle east that that some of the sufi mystics uh, protested against been going on for, 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 for a long time. So the plantation process involves a number of things, in, not just uh, plants, but it's often about movement of people. So that, that's the key. It's not about, it's been focusing on what, the cash crops, for example, but uh, that wasn't the same process. It's about plantation of people. And that's a very, very important te uh, technique uh, that the uh, empire used to move different groups, to create tensions, 
to set up things. This, this is a, a strategy. Um, the plantation that we're engaged in now is shifted is to plantate is to plant artificial intelligence in us. So we are the are, are the plantation that that, that 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 is it's implantation. It's the same philosophy. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. That was what was perfected uh, in Ireland, setting up groups against each other, taken. And these are run by commercial, it was run by the Corporation of, of, of London, which people don't understand that when William the Conqueror comes to London, uh, for example, in, in, in 1066, they leave the city of London alone. The city of London is separate. People don't understand. It's the longest running government in the world. It goes back to the Romans in, in, uh, in London. The site of the city of London, the financial area, is on the, uh, the site of the Roman remains uh, of temples. There's a horse track underneath. Um, uh, and even the separate city of London police uh, is, on, is where the Roman fourth was. It's quite in in incredible. And when you read about uh, Jack the Ripper in 1888, one of the issues that complicated that was there was a clash between jurisdictions because some of the murders were on the edge of the city of London. And uh, th there's two different systems. It's self-governing, it's different. Uh, and they were involved in all the, in all the issues. All these, what you talk about Bahamas, international finance, the city of London, the imperial structure never went away. And it goes, it directly goes back to the Romans. I mean, so when, when Philip K. Dick says the empire never went away, He's talking literally, mm -hmm. and he's, ta he's talking literally, and it's not just, it's just the same with the the when you when when you see the Normans taken over. The word Norman even has the word Roman in it, but I mean they were they were the remains of families that that were left when the Roman Empire collapsed, and Henry the Second and later and, and the Plantagenets they sought to reestablish uh, reestablish control. So. So we have to look at it in a, in a very holistic uh, context. But whatever context we do in, you, you, you're right, Phil, Phil, Philip K. Dick anticipated with a better sense that now we're moving into the mind and into the body and into perception. And that, that, that's where his great, his great genius uh, was. His senses were correct for when he's, he's sensing the Nixon administration. Now, I don't, I don't think it was Nixon himself. Remember, for example, that Donald Rumsfeld was involved with, from, from Nixon's time. I mean, he's a better figure to, to look the chart, the evolution, because <laughs> he's involved in a number, number of thing, th things. So Philip K. Dick understood that there was, it wasn't right, there was something wrong, that the Roman connection was there, that Washington, I think, Seven Hills, and all that kind of story about um, th that it was the same thing. And he could see the process. And he probably sussed out, as a lot of them did, that the psychedelic revolution, the hippies, there's a, a large fraudulent element to it. It's, it's a social experiment. Oh, yeah. It's a social experiment. And he, he perceived that. And he perceived it, in my view, because he had a longer term, a longer sense of history. And he had some, a very, very deep sense, as you know, well know, uh, uh, manifest in the, uh, in the exegesis in particular, a very deep concern for spirituality of the, of the, of the highest order. Oh, yes, indeed. The exegesis is like a living document. I open it all the time and it changes. I mean, I know Phil said the, the labyrinth shifts, but so does his words. Uh, and it's interesting, we could talk all day about his prophecies. There's so many that are true. But what I find interesting is that he warned us against AI and technocracy. I mean, most people forget that in uh, do sheep dream of electric dreams. Yeah, or, yeah. 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 He was, uh, he thought that machines could never be conscious or even human. I think, uh, you know, the Gnostics and William Blake saw the divine spark as the imagination of God, of creating in this world, leaving a better universe by our act of creation. I think with Dick, he saw the divine spark as our ability to have empathy for other people, for other animals, for our planet. And he was very serious that 
machines will never have empathy and making men machines is dangerous i mean he warned us and ridley scott the you know the friend of technocracy as we know he switched it in blade runner and kind of made it oh no uh you know uh replicants can have empathy we need to be on their side maybe descartes is a replicant so don't you think that's one of his uh great warnings and the other one too is that unlike other systems let, let's say the soviet system where you're being hitting with propaganda and you know you're oppressed i think in dicks even though you're being hitting with the propaganda and the pop culture and the drugs and psychedelics you can have a good life you can be a, work at a record store or be a, a, a show host but you can know that you live in an oppressive dystopia but you cannot do anything about it. It's like his characters n feel the weight of the empire and the empire kind of brags how it's oppressive, but that's kind of their joke or their, you know, their, their arrogance that, Hey, we live in a authoritarian uh, world, but there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, yes. Um, I, I was thinking, I, I read recently the short story sales pitch, 1953 54 where he's he's hounded to death by a robot a marketing robot i mean that was incredible i mean it's incredible that he he yeah. could see that clearly it, it is unbelievable um i'm glad he, he wasn't working for the enemy because it would have been <laughs> very dangerous but i mean it was remarkable uh prescience it, re it really uh, was r remarkable but i i wonder about because the general view is that his his figures or the figures that he chooses are kind of you know not high achieving people and that, that they're willie you know, loman but in a science <laughs> fiction <laughs> scenario <laughs> yeah yeah but the the an alternative reading might be that it's certain people on the margins who will survive it because they're not dragged into the the, the thing or they'll find a little space to get between it the, the, the crack in, in reality uh, there could be that reading as well, because uh, as we know, uh, intellectuals are very easy to hypnotize. I mean, this is a strange, a strange, or, or they, they fall for propaganda. I mean, there's been certain studies suggesting that, that you assume, you know, they have a critical thing, but critical thinking is not about that. It, it's a more, it's a more grounded uh, idea. And often these people that are in between in the liminal zone, working in the record shop are kind of they can see things uh, right. from that from that perspective like the knowledge that a barman might have from listening to people <laughs> when they're, when the they're guy drinking, shining whatever. your shoes has more yeah, wisdom yeah. than the executive exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so 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 i get that kind of sense uh often yes there's a, there's a thing about a thing that I'm, i've been reflecting on recently in relation to there's this motif that comes up on the celtic crosses i'm, I'm quite interested and I know that that, that you are in, in, in the connections uh, with with Egypt and that and, and the Ankh and, and and whatever. So there is a a theory, a, a significant scholarly theory, that the Celtic cross was was directly related to the the Ankh uh, symbol in in, uh, in Egypt, and there was very close relationships with uh, Christian early Christianity uh, around the Red Sea. Uh, in the 300s and Ireland. I mean, people don't understand that, that, that connection, the sea connection, and Ethiopia. It's, it's, it's very, very strange because they're on the margin. Um, and I, I would, uh, I'm going to distinguish and I'm going to make this case a bit stronger in the future that actually I think that there was more relevant spirituality happening in Scotland, uh, Wales, Ireland, uh, even England uh, at the, on the fringes than in places like Greece. Because if you look at this, you're right about the things you say about Greece, but the empire has been emphasizing one element, the noble element of, of Greece. They don't, they kind of put to the side the brutal military aspects of it, the tyrannies that were there, what they were fighting against, the brutality of it, the amount of wars that happened in, in, in that time. And these were translated into the, you know, the, as we know, the, the Greeks in, in the Roman context, the Roman empire, the France, and the same stuff going on. So, um, they were there, and you're right, uh, of course, about the link, the interest in the the automaton and in the armed uh, idea and th those things. Now, this is the classic for me. It's the classic interest of the magician 
of this creation of power of, of a kind of, of also associated with a great fear a, a need to control a need to have predictability a need to exert control over other people and this is what the the great people don't have and that's why the the lowliness of station is a, a humility. It, it is a liberating uh, fact. It's, it's, a, it's a respectable fact. It's a testament sometimes to not wanting to control people. It's, there, there, is, there is a humility that's necessary in the mystical journey to let go of things, not to be too attached. Uh, too attached. And yes, empathy and compassion. But we've got a strange concept of empathy and compassion now it, it, it's it's turned into something inconsistent with what it was what i was going to say about this uh, what i was going to say about this symbol that was going up is the symbol of when the two great uh, desert fathers mystics uh, met paul paul of thebes uh, and uh, the, the other chap who was the name of they met and a raven comes down with bread of heaven, uh, in, 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 with a loaf of bread to them. And this symbol was reproduced uh, in, on the Celtic crosses in, uh, in Scotland and Ireland. And to me, it represented something else. It represented empathy of mystics and access to a higher source by coming together. So empathy is not just, I feel sorry for you. How is there, uh, how is there this? It's not just that. It's a deeper thing. It's about the magic of connection between people, where by communicating, a higher dimension is opened and something that can't exist be, comes from that. So I, I see it in dialogue that something else, and that's simple, you can actually see it sometimes, that you get a triangularity, an openness to, to, to open up the higher channels. And I think that, that that's what it's about. So is empathy is not just about his his empathy includes this deeper sense understanding what it means for humanity it's not this weak version because that that's more what the sorcerer does to create victims victimhood is what this is about a lot of the movements that have been happening that we don't have to mention are about victimhood and, and a victim is for sacrifice and they're intended to sacrifice the people if i make life easy for you by saying listen you're a victim. You suffered in in Portugal, and 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 your family suffered. So I really, so we're going to make it easy for you and tell me about your pain, as opposed to you integrating that holistically into your life and using that as appropriate. Whatever. If we focus on that, we can make you weak. We can we can make you weak. We can make you uh, weak and become a victim then, and then we can manipulate you, and then we can also set you against other groups that we want to. Well, this guy over here, he's the guy. He was on the other side over there. Uh, he was the one that was, you know, all this kind of stuff. So his empathy is a deeper type. Uh, that is there. That's, as you, you know from your, your studies, that the essence of all significant spiritual traditions uh, is about first recognizing your own consciousness. And when you recognize your own consciousness and the power and the significance, that enables you to have empathy for someone else because you know if you believe in this stuff that person has that same divine consciousness the same spark the same capacity and in many senses what we have to do is to convince others to activate their own agency that's that's a that's a critical part of it and philip k dick as we know from having his experience in 1963 and seeing the face in the sky that, that, that brought him to christianity out, out of fear um he was he, he was doing so because he perceived and i mean it's it's a bit ironic met, the metallic kind of face in the sky we're getting yeah. now um so he's he's perceiving that and that deep that deep empathy drives him because people assume they often talk about mystics being anxious and mystics being concerned. And they always, uh, they do it to me sometimes when I put forward an argument saying, oh, you're, you're just a bit anxious. You're just a bit afraid. No, I'm not afraid at all. <laughs> it's, it's the opposite. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the absolute opposite. Uh, and people that go through those experiences lose that fear. They're certainly not afraid of death. Um, so uh, the the empathy that he's talking about is a much deeper thing and it's also a create a creative force and it's the unlocking of that is the antidote because it has power over the other the other things but the problem is 
if you're in a straight jacket, you can't do much. Oh, that's brilliantly said. Very inspirational. Uh, I was thinking you were talking about how people can get fooled. And I was thinking of uh, George Orwell's famous line. Some ideas are so idiotic, only an intellectual would believe them. Exactly. And there is, yeah. uh, I think Michael Malice, the anarchist, was talking on Twitter, was saying, you know, a smart dog is easier to train than a dumb dog. I'm sure my dog over here agrees, but that's... That's how these bad ideas infect the world, because somehow, yes. again, like you said, the hypnotism works and uses our intelligence against us. It's uh, it's important to dispel these things. And he's made, uh, interesting about uh, Malice, he's made some, I think he's made a, a lot of contributions uh, recently and, and, and through his work and a lot of very courageous uh, observations um, and a lot of very, very deep um, uh, observations and it's it is interesting that people are beginning to come out of particular compartments uh, which is very very important it's very important that we don't put people in compartments and say there's a person here and there's a and, and uh those labels so, don't work they're just no they're, exactly for those just listening in audio where can they find out more about you and your work and your books um i have a website i think it's james tony.com something like that i, I mean yeah, I don't have my browser open, but yeah, uh... <laughs> jamestony.com. I'm not on there, there. There are a couple of other James Tonys. They're not me. Um, on I don't do social media. I just stick to the the website, and um, so you'll find it on. I think it's www.jamestony.com, uh, and there's a bit of art and it links to interviews, uh, and uh, an email address and um, reference to the the the, the books on that. So 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 that's the the main point of contact before the internet breaks down. Another prediction, it'll be breaking down a bit more in the next year or so. Yeah. Uh, like, the so, so these things will be getting more difficult. So so get going, folks. You know, <laughs> now is the time. Wake up. Uh, so and let's have fun. Yeah, yeah. Get those pink beams. <laughs> a fun for all, as, as, there as you Joey go. said. There you a go. Fun feral. Yeah. <laughs> well, wonderful. Well, James, we really appreciate you coming on Aeon Byte, and uh, good luck with all your work. And we look forward to our next conversation. Maybe it won't be in the internet. Maybe we'll be in a, a cave while the bombs are exploding. But or a camp. whatever it is, <laughs> <laughs> some concentration camp. Oh, well, we have plenty of experience in the Irish. We, we, we were born and bred for that in Ireland. There, there you go. There you songs, go. And there was always a bad end. And you know, so. yeah. Well, great talking, Jim Miguel. Thank you very much. I really appreciate and and thank you for your work. And uh, that's again, I see you in the in the murmuration there. Everyone having a, a little influence, learning off you, yeah, and and for. For taking the path that you did, uh, respect that, and uh, and you give inspiration to me as well, and and uh, so thank you for that. I really appreciate. Oh it. well, thank you. Yes, we're all uh, yeah, like you said, points of light, inspiring each other, trying to lighten up the universe from the as Jung said, the darkness of mere being. Thank you. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. James is simply the gnosis bomb. In our second part, we'll delve deep into what made Philip K. Dick one of the great tech prophets. From being influenced by James Joyce to his Quaker background to so much else. It's spanning, I say, I say. James will also provide the answers to our situation. What can we do to stem the tide of transhumanism and all its dehumanizing tentacles? It's also a spanning section, but very inspirational and often practical, and we'll cover so much more. So please become an AB Prime member, Red Circle subscriber, or patron at Patreon for the full Valis Pink Beam. Only $6.99 for AB Prime, or $4.99 on Red Circle, or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon. Membership to AB Prime or Patreon mid-levels includes full access to more than 500 quality shows. You'll also get an invitation to the Inner Sanctum of Gnosis Facebook group and my Discord channel. Even support in the form of some shekel donations to PayPal or the US Mail really, really helps. 
There is also a link on the show notes if you want to donate via Stripe now. I also have the merch store and an Amazon wish list. Finding Hermes is going strong, and so are our virtual Alexander exclusive private meetings that include exercises loyal to the ancient Gnostics and a monthly intimate Q&A. If you want to understand and experience Gnosticism in its full impact and liberating secrets, become an official citizen of the virtual Alexandria. I've recently done presentations on the Sethians, the Jungian inner journey, the secrets of the serpent Gnostics, Gnostic sex magic and vowel magic, and why we live in Gnostic times, and covered a lot of Gnostic sex and their rituals. Woo! I know that's a lot, but I gotta stay spread out as I dodge the algorithms of the technocracy. I'm also on Rockfin or Odyssey if crypto's your bag. If you need help with all of these choices, just message my ass. I'm always here to help, and I truly appreciate your help. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always. <laughs>